Um, thanks again for everyone uh, joining us this uh, today on the, at the 27th Annual Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo and Policy Forum. Um, we have, uh, as, as you may know, um, the House is not in session this week. Um, came as a bit of a surprise when that announcement was made last year, uh, last week, but really, really want to say uh, thanks to our House Co-Chair, Representative Emanuel Cleaver, for joining us via Zoom. Uh, hopefully, I, presumably you're back in your district, sir, uh, having a great time and meeting with lots <laughs> of constituents and telling them about all the great work you're doing here in D.C. Um, some of your staff is here in the room. I'm not sure you can see them on the video, but thank you so much for being willing to Zoom in with us today. I'll turn it over to you uh, and uh, looking forward to hearing your remarks. All right, I, uh, uh, I'll be quick. I think this is, uh, I've trimmed this down to about 45 minutes. <laughs> and uh, uh, we'll, we'll feel, uh, I'll take a, a, breath, a breather at uh, 35 after I speak to 35 um, minutes. And then I'll go on through uh, to my full 45 minutes plus my 15 minute closing. Uh, <clears throat> First of all, thank all of you for uh, not just being there or being here, <clears throat> but uh, for, for what you do. And uh, we we are right now, I think, uh, in a phase where uh, we might be able, if we continue to work hard and, and, and continue to, to talk, uh, that we can uh, maybe make some changes now. Uh, as, as I think this group would know, we just experienced uh, uh, July 22nd as the hottest day ever recorded. The hottest day ever recorded. And yet I have some colleagues, they're good people, the Lord loves them, they take care of their lawns and, and feed their animals and so forth. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, they have not come to the realization uh, that... Um, you know, they have, we have all uh, responsibility. <clears throat> the earth is, the, in, my, in my real life, as I met this pastor uh, four years in seminary after college, uh, I, I, I have to say that one of the, the, the things that should push some of us is the, work, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, meaning that uh, at best uh, we are uh, renters. Um, and <clears throat> our rent is to take care of the a beautiful world that, that God has, has given us. Uh, as, as we all know, the, the challenging uh, time for reducing carbon emissions is now. <clears throat> and um, it, it's both uh, uh, an environmental uh, imperative from my uh, perspective, uh, but it is also an economic opportunity. And uh, that's where I have to uh, praise my uh, president, uh, Joe Biden. I'm not going to do a political speech. Don't worry. Uh, I do have one on my deck. That's why I'm not going to use that one. Um, but but I have to say that the, the president uh, has, in fact, created, I think, for the first time in our history, uh, a, a picture of the federal government trying uh, to respect the environment and to reverse a lot of the damage that's already been that has already been uh, done. Uh, and so, uh, in doing that, uh, he has created all of these uh, uh, economic opportunities, this, this vision uh, of uh, the, the world uh, being turned into what God uh, intended, uh, means that we all have to do our part, and it also uh, means that we have to have some other incentives, because we're humans and we, and, uh, we, we are weird animals. Um, but... It, there is a, a, a strong uh, economic opportunity, and uh, I, I think, from my perspective, this uh, commitment uh, uh, to, to this cause, uh, which you also have, is rooted in the belief that protecting our planet <clears throat> should go hand in hand with fostering economic growth and ensuring uh, well-being for for our families, uh, and in investing in energy efficient technologies and renewable uh, energy sources uh, represents one of the most effective strategies. And uh, I can't tell you 
uh, how important that is. And as each day goes by, that is going to become more and more uh, significant. Uh, and, and moreover, uh, transitioning to clean energy uh, is such an uh, economic engine that we're going to end up <clears throat> with new jobs being created <clears throat> all over uh, the United States. Uh, and uh, our, our whole economy is right now on the cusp of, of, of a transition. Now, uh, in our transitions, there are people who, who refuse to go. I mean, the, the you know, the, uh, I call them, uh, I don't like to call people names, but uh, if, uh, you know, I call them the, the troclodytic squad, uh, and, uh, and, and they are uh, good people, uh, but they want us to live back during the uh, Beaver Cleaver days of the 1950s, uh, and Beaver Cleaver and I are not related, uh, but uh, I, I, I do think that his era uh, represents uh, something to some people that's probably not, not accurate, but they want to go back. And uh, it, it comes right down to this. Uh, we have to have a focus on our communities. Uh, we have to focus on individuals and families <clears throat> and showing them how to navigate and, and um, establish climate conscious policies in our communities to, to protect and preserve these communities. Um, I, I used to live in public housing. I think there are four of us in Congress who actually lived in public housing. Uh, and uh, the temperature in public housing uh, is on average three degrees, uh, three to five degrees warmer than it is uh, any place else. Uh, uh, now, the reason I'm sharing that with you uh, is that uh, on the, this, this little ball that's rolling around in this uh, galaxy is our home, uh, and we don't have uh, the, the respect for it that we do. So we put the poorest people in, in places, uh, and then we, put, uh, we build an oven around them. And when you start putting people, have people living in areas uh, that are concrete, very few trees, very little vegetation at all, uh, then you, you're, you're going to find that the temperature difference between that spot in urban, usually in urban America, uh, and, the, and the suburban areas. Uh, and so uh, it is an issue that everybody uh, should be concerned about. <clears throat> and I keep going back to the fact that, uh, that, 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 that if you don't even like, uh, you know, for, for us to hear people talking about, uh, you know, the environment, just think economic opportunity. Because most of the problems that have been created will have to be addressed. And uh, to have it addressed, there's going to be a whole, in many cases, there's going to be a whole new world uh, created. Uh, for example, in Missouri, we're trying to do a lot of projects here. We have we we created what we were calling a, 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 an, an environmental corridor, corridor running from Independence, Missouri, uh, into Kansas City. Now, those Independence uh, is, is the home of Harry Truman, uh, and you you never know when you're in Kansas City and, and Independence at, at a certain point. So it, it's it's close. So we we're we're doing things with those uh, two communities, bridging those two communities together, having projects. Uh, together, for example, we've gotten about 10 EV buses. Uh, and when you get an EV bus, uh, you know, the maintenance is, is obviously not as great as it is uh, on, on an old uh, diesel uh, uh, gas guzzling bus. Uh, but uh, there were, when we started, no uh, mechanics in the largest city in the state of Missouri. Not one single mechanic to work on those buses that uh, we, we've been able to get uh, through the Department of Transportation. Uh, and so uh, so the, the younger people are going to see people who, who, who go to training, go to schools to be trained uh, just to work on electric vehicles. Uh, there is an economic opportunity in every single thing that we need to do to, to uh, make the environment uh, better. Uh, we are... Uh, uh, creating a, an opportunity up and down the roads. We have all of these uh, 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 spots around Missouri uh, 
where we have to, uh, you know, have fuel, which is electricity. And so um, uh, that those uh, will have to be installed. And then when something breaks down, uh, somebody will have to repair them. A whole new industry around uh, charging stations. A whole new industry around uh, re repair <clears throat> and replacement. And so I I'm excited about the possibilities. Um, and and I, I think that uh, you are, uh, you know, right on the uh, cutting edge of, of, of what we're talking about. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, over the next couple of years, uh, we will actually have people working around the country uh, in some of these positions. St installing, for example, uh, which is what we're also doing here, uh, solar panels on homes. And that gets organized, organized labor involved, and they love it. So you got the, uh, I, uh, the, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, IBEW. Uh, they, they, they work with, on, on the project. And then you have the laborers. So the, the laborers uh, bring the panels. Uh, they they, they uh, can install the panels uh, on, uh, on the rooftops. But then the IBEW comes in and does the connection. And so you got two labor unions, two separate labor unions. Who I was with uh, the presidents of both of them yesterday, uh, and I can tell you they are, they are excited about the fi fact that they had that, that they have now built in Kansas City. You're welcome to come and and see it. Uh, and, and and but they built this whole training center just to accommodate all the solar panels we're going to uh, install on on this corridor. So I'm, I'm going too long. But I, uh, what I wanted to make sure that I, I, I let you know is that this is not some theory anymore. It's real. It's, it's very real. And I would invite you to come to Kansas City. Uh, most of you probably don't live in places where they have real barbecue. Uh, uh, but uh, we, we had it here. Uh, I haven't figured out a way to put solar panels on top of a barbecue pit. But we're working on things like that. <clears throat> so... I'm excited about what, what, what we're doing here. I'm excited about the fact that, that you are excited. And if we keep getting other people excited, we can change this planet. We can change the direction uh, that we've been traveling. I appreciate you uh, giving me this uh, opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you. And I look forward to working uh, with most of you uh, in days to come. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Representative Cleaver, uh, for joining us. You, um, I'm not sure you heard it, but there was a collective tummy growl when you mentioned Kansas City barbecue. Uh, it's getting close to lunchtime, so everyone, uh, you certainly hit the spot with that. Thank you so much. And also, like, I think you're the first member of Congress to zoom into an ESI event. It's usually in person or it's video, so you are blazing trails as well. And um, I'd like to also just say a quick thanks to you and your leadership, of course, but also your great staff, Christine and Fabiola, and the rest of the team. Uh, have been really, really great to work with. So we all wish you a great rest of your day. It looks like a beautiful day out there, and um, we'll uh, find some time to connect for sure next time you're in D.C. Yes, yeah, so those will be 104. Oof. All right. Well, it's nice on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. Great to see you. All right. Take care. Uh -huh. Blessings. Thank you. All right. That was exciting. I was really not sure that was going to work. <laughs> um, but of course it's going to work, because Dano is doing it. Um, well, that was awesome. Uh, very, very cool of him to do that. Um, we had the first panel of the day, energy efficiency, because that's kind of where it takes you know, a, a logical place to start a lot of these conversations. Um, but rural issues and tribal issues have been part of ESI's congressional education program going way, way back before I started. Uh, it's uh, important to you know, think about areas where energy burdens are highest, and in many cases, that's in rural and tribal areas. And so we're really, really pleased to have this amazing panel uh, join us today to talk a little bit about uh, improving access to clean energy in those parts of our country. Um, again, if you're unfamiliar with the format, I'm going to make some very brief introductions, name, title, and affiliation. We'll go right on down the line, starting with Jamie. We will have a few moments at the end for questions. So if you have a question, my friend Lindsay has a microphone, and she'll 
do our best to make her way to you uh, when we get to that point. Uh, we're a little behind schedule, but not too, too bad. So um, uh, we'll um, give everyone their full time. Because I can't wait for this. This is a great panel. I'm really excited about it. Um, and Jamie, last year, I think you were also the first speaker on our rural panel. Uh, it doesn't get any better than having someone from the Rural Utility Service. Jamie, you're a senior advisor for the Rural Utility Service at the USDA. Thank you once again for joining us at our expo. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Okay. Thanks, Daniel. Um, and thanks, EESI, for inviting USDA today. I'm Jamie Jackson, senior advisor at Rural Utilities Service. Um, and it's, it's exciting to be here one year after last year having spoke. I initially offered one of my colleagues the opportunity uh, to speak on this platform. And their response was, thanks, but this is your opportunity for a victory lap. <laughs> While we are not yet there, there is certainly a lot to celebrate. If you are like the many 28.6 million viewers of the Olympics opening ceremony, um, I am tuned into the sports right now. I have my alarm set from 3 to 5 a.m. to watch track and field uh, and to watch these races. So I, I am excited about that and then also what we're doing here. So Russ celebrates that RD's loan and grant programs help support direct, job, direct jobs, um, constructing and maintaining systems, and indirectly supporting economic development through clean and affordable and reliable electricity. Also, RD's other programs can be used for wraparound, economic, community, infrastructure, and housing development. Russ celebrates RD's Tribal Relations Team and USDA's Office of Tribal Relations collaboration with federal agencies and the work of the White House Council on Native American Affairs and Energy Subcommittee, led by DOT and DOE with the collaboration of SUDI. Thank you. Russ celebrates Doug and several others' contributions to RD's uh, Equity Commission subcommittee. This subcommittee makes actionable recommendations that USDA can implement to modify programs, systems, policies to reduce disparities and advance racial justice and equity for underserved communities. Thank you, Doug. Today, Russ celebrates the resounding positive response to the $1 billion Powering Affordable Clean Energy PACE program and the $9.7 billion New Era program. It is, uh, it's exciting to hear how quickly, people got, how quickly people began supporting, and these programs are funded through the Biden-Harris administration via the Inflation Reduction Act, which we've spoken about so much today. So often, NOPOs are published, and people wonder, where do I apply? Am I eligible? How do I do this? What's the timing? So I also celebrate Keith and BEL. BEL provided significant technical assistance for both PACE and New Era. Um, Keith organized dozens of webinars and events and supported dozens of co-ops and technical assistance in applying for PACE and New Era programs. Thank you, Keith, and it's good to see you again this year. Um, Russ celebrates the support of the NRECA and its in-depth recommendations to USDA that help shape the New Era program and encourage prioritizing grid reliability, electricity, affordability, and flexibility. I want to make sure I get this quote right, so I'm going to read this part. As CEO Jim Matheson stated, the demand for the New Era program illustrates the innovative spirit of electric cooperatives as they explore new ways to meet tomorrow's energy needs and prepare for a future that depends on electricity to power this economy. So thank you, Jason. This could not have been a better alley-oop panel. There'll be plenty of sports metaphors from me today. Um, Ira is a game changer. Within the last six months, Secretary Vilsack announced over $450 million in PACE awards. To recap, some of these are um, some of these are battery energy storage systems, solar arrays, hydroelectric plants, and solar photovoltaic generation, and much more. In PACE and New Era, a requirement is implementing community benefits plans. Um, this is also an exciting element of the programs. And so far, I have seen dynamic submissions. This includes being committed to hire, hiring tribal members. This includes... Um, developing the American workforce and jobs, and to engage farmers directly to demonstrate how the community solar can provide cost savings and environmental benefits. 
So in conclusion, we are running this race together. Russ and I personally celebrate our partnerships. As Administrator Burke stated, our programs are the next type of forward-facing infrastructure that rural America needs. So thank you, Daniel, for this opportunity, and I'm excited to be here today. Wow, that was such a nice way to use your five minutes to <laughs> celebrate everybody. That was very nice. Um, thank you so much, Jamie. Great to have you back. Um, we have a long, long-standing relationship with everyone at Rural Utility Service, and we're very thankful for that. This year's expo um, allowed us to make some new friends at the Department of Energy, and that brings us to our next panelist. Raymond Redcorn is the lead policy analyst at the um, Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs at the U.S. Department of Energy. Raymond, welcome to our panel today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Appreciate that, Dan, and, and thank you, Jamie, for, for the warm introduction as well. Um, I, I want to start with a uh, tribal electricity access and reliability report that our office submitted to Congress at Congress's request. Um, and I just want to highlight a couple of facts and that really set the stage for some of the struggles that we're dealing with with energy in Indian country. Uh, so 16,000 homes, we estimate, still lack access to electricity and energy, uh, sorry, lack access to electricity in Indian country. Um, the average energy burden of native households is 28% higher than the U.S. average. I think we'll hear about some similarities between rural communities there. Um, I want to especially highlight uh, that this is true in Alaska, where oftentimes electricity prices are around a dollar to a dollar seventy-seven per kilowatt hour. Um, that later figure is about twelve times higher than the national average. Um, nationwide, tribal communities have about six and a half times more outages than the average American community. Um, and these are real struggles that, that we look to when we do work in the Department of Energy. Um, I want to connect some history here. So the Rural Electrification Act of 1936 uh, did a lot to establish the, uh, the grid and the co-ops that uh, both tribes and rural communities depend on right now. But the Rural Electrification Act of 1936 did not mention Indian tribes anywhere in that bill. And even today, Indian tribes are still not mentioned in as the Rural Electrification Act of 1936 has been amended. Um, clearly, USDA is still doing a lot to make sure that tribes have access to, uh, to their programs, um, but that history really frames a lot of the struggles that tribes are dealing with. Um, they've inherited a infrastructure which they don't have a lot of control over, even though in theory they have sovereignty over. Um, and connected to that are many energy generation projects, which tribes did not have a lot of ownership in the development of, whether those were um, uh, large-scale hydro projects, which disrupted salmon fisheries, or whether those were nuclear projects, which the mining of which affected those tribal communities. Um, and, and this is sort of the history which we are grappling with. But today, tribes are increasingly taking the lead in developing their own energy projects, um, asserting their sovereignty over energy, uh, developing their own utilities, ensuring reliability and affordability for their own citizens, and prioritizing that along the way. And DOE is doing its best to support tribes in this work. Um, I, I want to highlight uh, the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations Rural and Remote Community in their last award. Uh, they awarded $78 million to rural and remote communities, and uh, nearly half of that went to tribes, uh, 13 tribal projects in particular. Uh, the Grid Resilience Program out of the Grid Deployment Office is providing formula funds to tribes to, uh, to bolster their own grids and, and bolster the resilience of those. Uh, the last panel talked a little bit about appliance rebates. Uh, state and community energy programs is, is just getting out the first awards to tribes uh, for home electrification appliance rebates, which uh, we do expect will impact the affordability of, of electricity for those homes. And then the Loan Programs Office uh, uh, recently awarded its first loan guarantee to a tribe. That's the VAS microgrid project, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit later. Um, I'm from the Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs. We support all of these other programs, but we also directly interact with tribes and support tribal energy projects. Uh, our office is going through a high growth phase. Uh, just to give you some context, between 2010 and 22, we, uh, we distributed a two, uh, $120 million across 210 projects across the United States, four tribes. Um, in FY23 alone, we did $75 million. Uh, again, from 2010 to 2022, 
Uh, we did $32 million of projects just in Alaska. That was across 55 projects. $20 million in FY23. So we're on a high growth trajectory. Our office did not receive funding through uh, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law or Inflation Reduction Act, but uh, we have, sorry about that. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, we have had a, a, a recent increase in annual appropriations. We're very focused on issues of capacity building, which we know are, are first and front in Indian country, and we'll be talking, I think, a little bit about later in the panel. So just want to set that, that context and, and say thanks for having us here. Thanks for being here, Ryan. Um, that brings us to panelist number three, Doug O'Brien. Doug is the president and chief executive officer of the National Okay, Daniel, thank you. Uh, always good to be here and to work with EESI. Uh, just a, a couple quick thank yous right off the bat. Um, to, to the federal family, and that I'm talking about the agencies and those uh, here on the House and the, and the Senate side, the, the work that has, has led to this conversation, uh, it's easy to... Uh, to sort of forget about how historic some of this is. Um, that work, that, that heavy lift that happened here on the Hill, but then the, the huge amount of work that happened in the agencies. I, I have some uh, direct knowledge of what that takes. It's, it's really, uh, it, it goes beyond generational. I mean, it, um, the work that's being done at, at Department of Energy, at USDA, at Russ, and other places. So thanks to everybody for all of that. I just want to make... Um, a couple quick points and, and really look forward to the continued conversation. Daniel mentioned I'm, I work with the National Cooperative Business Association. We're the apex association for all kinds of cooperatives. So that includes rural electric cooperatives. So I'm, I'm going to hold because I want to hear it from Jason. He's going to be the authority uh, on that today. But, uh, but we also have within our umbrella farmer cooperatives, credit unions, worker cooperatives, food co-ops, housing co-ops, etc. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to why I think it's it's important to think about cooperatives in, in just a moment. Um, the the first point I want to make is, and and really I think Raymond, you've you've done it uh, in, uh, in very effectively already. That when someone's thinking about uh, focusing time and resources on federal policy, rural places are a really important place to do it. Um, while uh, poverty is actually decreasing in rural places, as reported by the U.S. Department of Agriculture Economic Research Service, it's still very significant. So there's about 328 persistent poverty counties in the country, uh, and, and that's defined as a, a county that's been in poverty for at least three decades. Fully 85% of those counties are in rural places. So if, if what you care about are people uh, with lower resources, then, then rural is a place that you really need to care about. If, if what you care about is making sure that, uh, that those families have an opportunity to, to live a full life, then focusing on energy policy is really smart. As, as Raymond mentioned, the amount of household income spent on energy in rural places generally is, is quite a bit higher. Now you think about in those relatively poor households and that percent of income that they spend on energy is, is really uh, monumental. So any, any decrease and the significant decrease that they have to spend on energy, that means more money for transportation to get to work, for medicine for the family, uh, maybe for access to broadband so they can actually participate. I mean, it, it really, really matters. So just on that economic, beyond the environmental, which folks have been talking about, uh, it's, it's really important. So I, I really laud those who are working on that policy. The other point I want to make is how do you move these programs? So if you, if you agree with me that it's really important to have good energy policy in rural places, then of course the question is, well, how do you, how do you scale that? How do you make it go and how do you make it go fast, as a lot of people have already talked about today? There has to be intermediaries. Rural places tend to have less capacity. I mean, kind of obviously. They have, um, they have demographics that are sometimes lower resource that we talked about, but they also have demographics where there's just not as many people. That means that the typical in intermediaries, whether that's 
uh, a big county government or a city government or even big nonprofits and NGOs that focus in more urban areas. That doesn't happen in a lot of rural places. So you really have to figure out who's, who will be your partner. Now, in, when you're talking about energy, in the majority of rural places, your best partner is going to be a rural electric cooperative. Uh, they serve the majority of uh, the continent in the United States, the vast majority of the continent in the United States, but not every place. There are places uh, throughout the United States where, where co-ops don't serve. So, so one needs to be flexible. Policy needs to be flexible in those intermediaries that are able to educate those household and businesses and to help them apply for that funding and help them implement and make those connections. Uh, so that's, that's the other big point I think I'd make. Um, the, the last point I'd make, just staying on cooperatives, again, look forward to hearing about the rural electric cooperatives, and just talk about credit unions for 30 seconds. One out of three people in the United States are members of credit unions. They're cooperatives. They're, they're consumer financial cooperatives. More and more, they're looking to do work in rural areas. And many of them, an increasing number, are community development finance institutions that are focused mm -hmm. on areas of relatively lower resource. A lot of them are interested in energy policy more and more. Uh, so there's another interesting cooperative partner uh, out there. So Daniel, thank you. Look forward to the continued conversation. Thank you. Yeah, I remember last year at your impact conference, you had mm -hmm. Inclusive and a bunch of other yep. uh, credit unions talking. It was yep. very interesting. Yep. Um, that brings us to Keith Dennis. Uh, Keith is the president of the Beneficial Electrification League. Keith, always really, really nice to see you. Take okay. it away. Yes, and, and thank you uh, for having me and, and for your partnership. Um, we're talking about helping, helping folks uh, to access some of this federal funding um, the Beneficial Electrification League has, has played a big role in that, and, and we uh, have actually partnered with mm -hmm. EESI on some of this, and, and of course, uh, USDA, so really appreciate being here. Um, our mission um, is to facilitate um, electrification when it's beneficial, and um, we work with a lot of electric cooperatives and electric uh, and, and municipal utilities in, in small towns in rural America. Um, I just want to take a step back and, and, and just kind of recognize how important electricity has been to rural areas. And um, we go all around the country, talk to lots of folks, and I love hearing testimonials of people who talk to their about their grandmother who remembers when uh, electricity came and a big part of life was cleaning dishes and, and washing clothes and, and doing all this stuff that that we take for granted today because of electricity. And, and when I heard Representative Cleaver talking about um, the people who are being trained to, or gonna be trained to, to, to work on electric school buses, it just reminds me how much of a continuum this is. And while it seems like he's talking about the future, he's just talking about what's been happening this whole time. I mean, there's been people, we were 100 years ago, we'd be talking about, hey, maybe someday people will be able to fix these, these washing machines we have, or these dishwashers, or blenders, or other things we have. Um, the, the improvement that electricity brings to people is just phenomenal. And, and we had that big initial push with USDA RUS's help, the, the, the New Deal, and, and we sort of forget what that means. Well, now we're talking about other challenges that people are really interested in, like the climate challenge that, that, that um, Cleaver was talking about. And, and um, when you look at how you would solve a problem like that, the, the answers all go through electricity. Um, you, you, you just you look at these pathway um, scenarios where people say, how do you get to a lower carbon future? And the only way to do that is through having electricity. Um, and, and that's, that's, that's um, including the electricity we have today. Um, uh, if you use the electricity from the grid today to power electric vehicle, you're going to be better off than using um, a, a gasoline vehicle, according to union concerned scientists in every state. So um, it, this isn't something where like, oh, we need all this new types of electricity to make this, this possible. Right now, the sheer improvement in quality of life of using electricity for when it's a, a better product is already there, and then there's this kind of added benefit uh, where it can save people money and where it can help the environment. So we call that beneficial uh, electrification, and, and we, we, we like to think of it as not necessarily a new thing. Um, this huge investment from the, from the government in, in IRA and IIJA, which if that's not enough acronyms, I'm just going to name some of the projects <laughs> we've been working on. <laughs> USDA's PACE, a new era, GDO's GRIP, Grid Resiliency, <laughs> BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, Projects, SCAP, the, the State Community Energy Efficiency Block Grant Program, EECBG, uh, uh, Energy Futures Grant, the EFG from SCAP, uh, OSED, which you talked about, uh, the ERA, so, so and, and the Appalachian Regional Commission, which we call ARC. So, Imagine if you're in a rural area and you're understaffed and don't have a lot of people helping you with this. Just somebody comes and starts 
blabbering this, you know, Washington DC talk about all these things that could help your life. I mean, it's almost comical that, that I mean, it's just, where would you even start? It sounds, sounds great, but what are you talking about, right? So um, we have really been working to um, try to help implement this by filtering out where things might be relevant to, to certain um, folks, especially in the electric sector. One of the big ones, of course, was PACE and New Era. Uh, we helped with $8 billion worth of applications to that program. Of course, the Grid Deployment Office also with their GRIP program has been, been, been very important. Um, the tribes um, have a good opportunity to electrify. Some of those folks aren't even electrified, but they also have lots of opportunities for rebates and just generally improving their, gri their grid. One of the nice things about the, um, s some of the way that this works is a lot of money, Congress passes it to the states through formula, which is, which is a, a way to make sure that um, the programs are tailored more locally. The tribes actually get to, to, to be a state themselves. So you actually don't go through that whole process of going straight to the street, you go straight to the tribes. So there's actually a lot of opportunities to help tribes, and we've been helping them to navigate this. Um, this program. So I think, I think the, the two, two or three points I'd like to make is that, one, technical assistance is absolutely needed. You know, it's great to have Congress pass a bill. It's great to have the government talking about what their rules are. Uh, it's great to have people who want to do something. But there needs to be somebody in between, and often it's not, not the government. And we really um, are grateful that philanthropy has really helped step up that, and we're a nonprofit uh, working to help. So this this navigating this is, is, is uh, really important. And then the other, the, the last point I'd like to make is it's really time to implement this. We talk about this great bill that got passed and all this achievements. Nothing's been achieved when you pass a bill. <laughs> uh, I, I go all across the country, we have rooms full of people, we say, who's heard of IRA? Who's heard of IIJA? Who wants to apply? Who's applied? Who's gotten any money into their bank account? And right now it's nobody yet, almost. There's some states that have got some TA money. That means this whole thing we're talking about is all in front of us. So it's, it seems like we've been climbing a hill or we're part of a marathon, but we really haven't even started yet. So we're maybe at the base of an enormous mountain mm -hmm. if, if things go that way. And, um, and, and I think what we need to think about is, you know, how do we implement this and make sure that this is successful now and then continues into the future? So it's not this big one-time thing that was very confusing and then comes and goes. We really, to leverage this, need sustained effort from you all to, you know, foster this improve where it's not, not, not done well, uh, and, and, and then reinvest where it's working well, like reinvest in the things like the new eras and the paces. And that's what's going to be the legacy of this if, if, it's, if it's successful is, is, you know, what actions are we doing going forward? Not only celebrating that we got this passed, but like actually doing it. So uh, thank you again. Thank you, Keith. That was great. Um, Jason uh, Cook is our next panelist. Doug teed you up, Jason. We have a lot of pressure on you to tell us all about rural electric cooperatives. I know you're up to the task. Jason is the Legislative Affairs Director for the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association and another great friend of EESI. Jason, great to see you. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, yes, I'm teed up, ready to catch the alley-oop. <laughs> hand, hand me the baton. Um, we're going to go hiking up the hill. Um, but we're here, the, 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 the end of the, of the proverbial uh, metaphor, whatever it is. Um, so for everyone who doesn't know, electric co-ops are private, independent, not-for-profit electric utilities. They're owned by the communities that they serve. Um, they were established to provide at-cost electric service. Um, each co-op is, is locally governed through a board of directors that are elected uh, by the members that they serve. Uh, any excess revenue to the co-op is returned back to the members in the form of a credit on their bill or a check from the cooperative. We were formed uh, to bring electricity to rural parts uh, of America where other utilities wouldn't go um, because they determined it was too expensive, too difficult to serve. Nationwide, um, there are about 900 electric cooperatives that serve one in eight U.S. residents, mostly in rural and ex-urban communities. Compared to other utilities, co-ops often serve the areas with the lower, lowest population density, uh, lower medium income, and higher cost to deliver electricity mm -hmm to those areas. Electric co-ops serve 92% of electric, uh, of the nation's persistent poverty counties, which I think is critical as we kind of talk through some of the challenges. 
Electric cooperatives in the federal government have had a partnership for a, a long time, dating back to the 1930s. Um, as I mentioned, as urban areas were electrifying, uh, rural areas were being left behind, farmers and other rural residents banded together to form a cooperative um, so that they could uh, pull down a low interest loan uh, from the Rural Electrification Administration. What was then REA is now RUS. Um, and those low cost electric infrastructure loans are still critically important to providing affordable, reliable electric service for uh, rural Americans. A kind of new chapter of electric cooperatives relationship with the federal government was born with passage of the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, this law for the first time gave electric cooperatives access to tax credits for new energy technologies, including carbon capture, nuclear energy storage, renewables, and more. Also, as, as it has been covered here, the creation of the new era and the PACE programs at RUS were critically important for electric cooperatives as they work to build the infrastructure that's gonna be necessary to power the future. RUS also offers energy efficiency programs. I know that was covered on the panel before this, but the specifically the Rural Energy Savings Program is very helpful to electric co-ops uh, who have uh, members who uh, could reduce their energy bills through um, retrofitting homes. That program allows uh, for an electric co-op to pull down a zero interest loan from RUS to, to see those upgrades through and then pay RUS back with um, an on-bill payment. Um, one aspect of RESP that I would just mention is that participation is incredibly difficult for an electric cooperative that has um, only a, a small staff. It's, it's a pretty large administrative undertaking and so um, NRECA is very supportive of looking at ways to maybe include a grant with, with that. Um, finally, the Rural Economic Development Loan and Grant Program um, at USDA is a program that allows for our members to um, find unmet needs in the community and use their borrowing relationship with USDA to meet those needs. A great example of that is, you know, the local town or county needs a fire truck but doesn't, you know, might not have the financing or financial relationship to, to, to see that through quickly um, if they need it um, in, in um, a short period of time. The electric co-op can guarantee that loan um, for the town uh, or county or other small business. Um, think about like child care services, think about primary care. Um, it's critically important for our members who see themselves as, as more than just poles and wires companies. So in closing, thank you for uh, the opportunity to chat with everyone today. Um, happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Thank you, Jason. That's great. Um, my friend Lindsay up here has a microphone, so we'll keep an eye out for uh, him to go up uh, in the audience. And I know many of our panelists on our next panel are already here. We're going to go probably another 10 minutes or so. Representative I'm not on. I'd like to come back to an issue that a number of you have talked about, and that is capacity constraints. Um, and, you know, Keith, you were talking about how all of these resources are ahead of us. Well, they've been with us now for a couple years. Um, what could we be doing? And Jamie, maybe we'll start with you since you're the, you were, it's been a little while since we've heard you. Um, how could we be reducing or managing these capacity constraints to help rural areas do more and do more faster uh, and deploy these investments. And basically, you know, the end of the day, we want people to be realizing the multiple benefits that come with investments in renewable energy and energy efficiency. So how could we lower some of those barriers and address some of those capacity constraints? Great question. Thank you. Um, when one of the things you just mentioned were multiple benefits and earlier um, it was said about policies that need to be flexible. When I look at our programs such as PACE and New Era and REAP, um, these programs are designed to be paired with other federal lending. Um, that can also be paired with the tax credits. 
And looking at some of the examples with the Treasury Direct Pay or, or inter Interior Tribal Energy and Mineral Grant Programs, um, that is part of the process of removing the barriers, is making it more accessible to people, um, reducing some of the um, forms that have to be submitted, and getting rid of all the words that can sometimes be on websites that uh, Keith was just talking about earlier, and then the technical assistance portion of partnering more with the communities. Um, lastly, uh, reducing those barriers is engaging with the communities mm -hmm. and asking them, what is it that you need instead of someone coming in and telling them what they need? I think it's really helpful to listen to those concerns and then also look ahead of what can be scalable. And Raymond, you know, you talked about how much your office has grown in recent years. So how are you managing to reduce those barriers and, and manage those capacity constraints to get those resources that are now newly available to your office and to the communities? Yeah, uh, well, I want to start with what Jamie said, you know, listening to these communities. Um, I, want, I want to acknowledge we have a working group. It's called the uh, Energy, sorry, Indian Country Energy and Infrastructure Working Group. And uh, seeing Bill and Ira come through, they, they recognize that tribes are having trouble accessing these programs. Um, and we have TA, we have um, lots of other, uh, in certain parts of DOE, we have navigators. Um, we're building up our relationship with intertribal organizations right now in the, in the um, Office of Indian Energy. Um, but one thing the working group identified is, is that they want to see capacity investments within Indian tribes. Um, and they kind of reference the state energy program as a, as a metaphor. The state energy program allows, um, provides consistent administrative funding to states um, with a lot of flexibility for those states to administer the programs that are most relevant for, for their states and their communities. Um, tribes don't have that consistent administrative support. So they're going from grant to grant, they're seeing the cycles, um, at, but without capacity already in place, it's harder for them to access bipartisan infrastructure law and Inflation Reduction Act funding. Um, and so we've been focused on um, working with Congress where we can, um, working with tribes where we can, to, um, to get the programming in place to help tribes in, with that capacity overall. That capacity kind of atrophies, right? It's like a muscle. If you don't exercise it, the capacity can't be allowed to atrophy. Doug, very curious, and you have a, such a broad membership, very curious what you have to think about uh, or what you have to say about capacity constraints. Oh, uh, I, briefly, because it's mostly echoing what, what folks have already said and, and what Jason mentioned too, that as... Um, as programs are developed, I think policymakers need to need to consider whether the the target audience will be able to access and reach, know about, apply. Uh, I mean, that just needs to be part of the basic policy and analysis. I mean, certainly, you know, you you need to you're going to figure it out outcomes on how much you know carbon is saved or how many kilowatts or. But, but part of that analysis has to be, will this actually reach the target audience? And if the answer is n not without something else, well, then provide the something else. And it might be a grant on the REST program. It might be uh, some, some uh, flexible intermediary, intermediary dollars in rural places so that those rural places have that capacity, that locally-led capacity, to solve, you know, the, the problems that are the priorities. Um, so there's there's a myriad of ways to do that, but I think that just needs to be a very fundamental uh, part of the policy analysis. Great, thanks, Keith. You talked a little bit about this as well, but yeah, you know, how do we get more out? Well, how do we get more of this out there? <clears throat> well, I, I like capacity constraints because it's actually a term of art that means something else in the energy industry. But it, but I think it's relevant because you know um, there there's a. Uh, uh, concern in rural America that, you know, as people want to have more things like electric vehicles and renewable energies, there's, there's not really the, um, the infrastructure um, in, in, in throughout the country. Um, and I know you're talking specifically about this investment and the capacity of people to do this, but, but I think it's also um, relevant to, to sort of uh, note that this is going to take a long time. And, and we're resigned to that. We're resigned to the fact that building infrastructure in rural America takes a long time. And I think when you come to accept that, you, you, you lose a little bit of the frustration. 
Um, the, the issue is that, you know, um, if you're talking about adding a lot of like school buses and, 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 and vehicles to these places, um, they're going to say, look, that's nice, but it's going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in line upgrades. We have 20,000 people living here and they're in poverty. <laughs> so where is that money going to come from? Um, and, and they're going to sound like they're actually opposed to something. And it's going to be like, why would you be opposed to this? Like, there's going to be cleaner air. They're going to have cheaper energy. And the thing is, you need to get that investment there. Um, it, it, I, I liken it to um, roads and bridges and, and, and buses and, and solar panels being like uh, cars, like trucks. You can't just drop a bunch of trucks in the field and say, now you can you know, move your goods easier if you don't have any roads and bridges. Mm -hmm. So the poles and wires are these, these roads and bridges. Now, the infrastructure and the capacity to do that, you know, we've been very successful in finding partners when we have had funding to be a technical assistance to them and when they trust us. There's no lack of, of that. The government is a slow partner to work with. <laughs> and, and so um, the, the partners that, you, that these folks need to work with have to understand how the government works and give them a realistic timeline and just plug through it. Because none of us are realistically going to make the government work that much faster. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's a lot of cooperation and a lot of just understanding how this works and, and that, it, that it's going to take a long time, but that it's necessary to, to do this work. Yeah. And Jason, you have hundreds of members, 900 members. You meet one, you, you go to one rural energy service territory, or rural electric cooperative service territory, you've been to one, right? Yeah. But they all have this in common. Uh, how, do, uh, how are you all working to uh, reduce some of these barriers? Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, we talked about the RESP grant component, and that just, you know, our members uh, in a lot of cases have more capacity than others in these rural communities, and it's still... Uh, a large undertaking a lot of times, uh, or in some in instances we've seen, too large of an undertaking for them to, um, you know, reasonably move forward uh, with doing some of these energy efficiency upgrades. I think we all agree um, it w would be uh, mutually beneficial. And so um, I'm not saying that there's any problem there, but I mean, that does underscore some of the, like, challenges that we face, is that even if... Uh, the electric utility is, is struggling to um, build that capacity. It's a real problem. So. Thanks. All right, I'm going to look. I don't see any hands going up, so I'm going to move on to my rapid fire. Everyone get, Jason, maybe we'll start with you and then come this way so Jamie has the last word. But uh, challenge here is this has to be quick, but it's a lightning round. Um, where would, let's say you're back here, 32nd Annual Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo. What would you like to be talking about five years from now in terms of success? for NRECA and its members, and then we'll move down the line. Uh, pace the new era, uh, successes, obviously, and then, you know, continued res resources to USDA, um, because our U.S. knows uh, the rural utilities uh, the best. Great. Keith? And I, I, there's a little bit of, you know, uh, political uncertainty right now, and, and, and um, I, I hope that no matter what happens with, with politics, that we look back at this investment and we say we made the most of it, and, and that people just kind of stick with the, the plans that have been developed and the, and the large amount of applications that have come in and, and funding available and implement it. And I think that will benefit everybody in the country if we can do that. Thanks. Doug? Because Congress and, um, and the executive agencies have come to realize just how important it is to have flexible capacity in rural places, they've invested um, significantly. Uh, in individual programs and in the Rural Partnership Program that was part of the Farm Bill of 2023, five, four, <laughs> five, uh, and, uh, uh, and that Rural Places have been able to access these, uh, these really generational uh, programs because of it. Great, thanks. And Raymond? Uh, my vision would be tribes uh, working towards generating, managing, and owning their own power systems. Mm -hmm. Um, with, again, I'll echo that those investments um, are, are critical um, no matter where they come from. Thanks. And, Jamie, you get the last word. You made such a nice intro comments. This is your reward. You get the last word today. <laughs> Thanks. Um, in five years, I, I'm looking forward to seeing the operational projects from these many programs, as we've highlighted. I want to see that the energy cost for the communities have decreased. I want to see increased jobs and development of, of training. Um, when I look at the, the LOIs that came in and the awards that are being made in PACE, which is a loan forgiveness program specifically for tribes, and then also with New Era, which is for cooperatives, 
I cannot wait to see how it transforms rural America and how it just becomes more innovative. So in five years, we have a lot to talk about, Daniel. Great. Awesome. Sports Oh, no sports uh -uh. <laughs> you were the cleanup hitter. It'll, it'll be, um, at least we pass the baton to the next stage, right? I feel like it has to be you stick the landing. <laughs> Not right? yet. So my, my daughter is a competitive, gym, uh, a competitive gymnast. Sticking the landing is a big deal, but then also all the complexity before you get to the landing. And that's where we are. Is there such a thing as a non-competitive gymnast? And, you know, the, the, like the, the, the wreck was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we're going to end it there. Jamie, Raymond, Doug, Keith, and Jason, thank you so much for being part of our Expo and Policy Forum this year.